So uh, today the session is on how to write letters and emails. So um, by the end of the workshop, is that not? That's coming up on my screen. It just froze on mine. Right, can you see right. it? <laughs> Yeah, so by the end of the workshop, you should be able to recognise the importance of planning uh, your answer to a writing question, identify characteristics of a letter and an email, to be able to structure different documents, so obviously the letters and emails, and understand the difference between formal and informal language. <clears throat> so the purpose of text. There are different texts in which um, they're written as well as read. So below are a few examples. <clears throat> so texts that explain, an example of it would be a leaflet um, explaining a theme park. <clears throat> so you might get, um, you might see a review and the purpose of that review would be describing. Um, a recipe would be instructing people. Um, again, that's the purpose of the text. So text that persuade would be an advert for um, a cleaning product, maybe uh, text that argue a letter protesting about schools closing down. But again, a lot of these um, examples can fit into each other. So it might not necessarily be um, a letter. It could be an email. It might not be a report. It could be um, an article. So they do all feed into each other. Um, so texts that discuss uh, maybe a report about how traffic is on, on is on the road. Texts that advise um, could be a web page telling you to save your money. Texts that entertain and amuse. So an example of that would be an article about um, a funny real life event, maybe. Um, something that you're inquiring, inquiring about could be an email to a restaurant asking about their menu. And then texts that inspire a web page with ideas for maybe children's party games. <clears throat> but again, like I said, a lot of these feed into each other. So they're just a few examples of how you could write certain texts. It is good, isn't it? They, they, will, they will ask those things in, in the question, in the scenario they give you. So they'll say, yeah. write a letter explaining or write a letter um, to discuss or something like that. So it is worth looking out for those words because there are subtle differences, as, as Eamon says, between to explain something is obviously quite, or describe is quite detailed than yeah. um, just to discuss, which maybe is a little bit more informal, for example. Yeah, perfect. So the purpose of text. So persuasive texts try to convince the reader to do something. So again, a lot of these um, screenshots, little snippets, have come from the CPG books, which are linked to city and guilds, uh, obviously where you'll be sitting your exams. So persuasive texts sometimes um, use words that make the reader feel something. Uh, they also use facts to sound more convincing. So the example they've given is the outstanding new X4600 is sleek, easy to use and reliable. It has a number of excellent features, including accurate GPS tracking. You can pinpoint your location to within 20 miles, meters. I don't know what the M is yet. Um, it even lets your friends know where you are so you can find each other in a crowd. The Trevina X4600 is the future. It's the smartest phone around. Get yours now. So if you have a look at where the arrows are, so the word reliable that's pointing at, the text is trying to persuade the reader to buy a new phone. Um, words like outstanding, outstanding, sleek and excellent impress the reader. So it's trying to persuade you to do something. And again, you can use them techniques in your written exam. So even if you're writing a letter of complaint, you're trying to persuade whoever you're writing that letter to that actually whatever's happened is wrong in that scenario. <clears throat> so texts that argue want the reader to agree with an opinion. So if you're writing a text to make a point, you obviously have one opinion, which is very clear. So you can either go one side of the argument but you can bring in the other side of the argument too. And if you do do that, that will give you your, le your level two criteria straight away. Um, but then you have to identify which side of the argument you're at at the very end of your text. Um, they often use facts to back up arguments and forceful language to show how they feel. So the example they've given is the tracking technology installed with the new Trevina X4600 is a disgrace. It allows anyone with your phone number to know exactly where you are at any time. There are already over 10,000 cases of stalking each year. Tracking technology is bound to make things worse. So with the arrows, they've written, the writer's opinion is clear from the very start. Um, facts help 
back up the argument. And then they've used strong words like disgrace, so it shows how angry the writer is. So again, they've they've used the emotive technique, what we spoke about last week and week before, um, in their text. Uh, texts that discuss a topic use evidence to reach a conclusion. So this is where they discuss and give more than one opinion. They often look at both sides of the argument and then reach a conclusion. So here, obviously going with the rest of the examples, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the new phone. I agree that the GPS technology would make it easier to follow or even stalk someone. However, I am impressed by the accuracy of the GPS function and will be useful sometimes to see where your friends are. Overall, the phone is an excellent example of modern technology. So the arrows, the text is balanced because it gives two different opinions. The text finishes with a conclusion. With your level two um, exams, they they would they will want to see if if it is um, an argument or an opinionated text, and they'll want to see which side you're going for. But they will want to see the other side of the argument as well, where you then make a conclusion on on whatever it is that you're talking about. Has anyone got any questions on that? No. No, all okay. looking good. I thought the uh, the recording went then. Yeah. <laughs> so just talking to yourself. No, we're yeah. silly. <laughs> uh, so planning your answer for both emails and letters. Make a plan before you start your writing. So planning your answer will help you put your ideas in order. A plan doesn't need to be in full sentences. Just write your key points to save time. <clears throat> Make sure you only write the points that um, answer the question. You you will be given space to plan your answer in the test, but it won't be marked. You can also use this planning space to do a first draft if you need to. Um, so using your notes to write your plan, figuring out who, who your audience and your purpose is will help you identify the text if it's formal or informal. And again, I think we covered that last week in the last uh, last session. You do straight away, you need to know who your audience is, so who you're writing to and what the purpose of that text is. So are you persuading? Are you trying to inform someone? Are you explaining something? If you identify them points straight away, you know exactly what you're writing. So write, then write down your points, which you want to include. Organise your points, your most important idea first. If you're given bullet points in the question, be sure to answer them in your text. So um, a simple example of it is write an email or a letter to the head teacher uh, of, your, of your son's school telling them about the problems your son's facing. So the audience is your head teacher. The purpose is you're informing. So the letter straight away will be a formal letter. Um, again, it could be an email or a letter, whichever way you want to write it. The number one bullet point, your son's been bullied, doesn't want to go to school. Number two, um, it's been highlighted briefly, but nothing's been done about it. So the matter has become obviously worse. And number three, there's an emotional impact and reflection on his learning. So obviously he doesn't want to attend school, um, which is where he's missing his vital learning. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah. Louise, Louise has just asked, will it be clear what is expected or would they put in curveballs and, and I don't know, trick questions and things? No, it's, it's quite simple. I mean, at the end of the PowerPoint, there's an example of a actual mock exam. So I've put a few different examples in and then the very last slide is um, a snippet from a paper, a previous paper. And it'll ask you, it'll give you a scenario, it'll tell you what it wants and then it'll ask you to write a letter, an article, a blog to um, a certain... Okay. Yeah, there's um, I mean, the, 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 there are no trick questions is the first thing to say. Sometimes people disagree after a testing. Oh, that was a trick question, but there isn't. I think mm -hmm. particularly writing, though, they are usually quite good at giving you the information. They sort of give you the information you need and yeah. so you can do it. They're not necessarily looking for somebody who is the most imaginative I don't know, version of Shakespeare ever. What they're looking for is, is your content, your structure, um, spelling, punctuation and grammar all correct and things. So actually, they're not. You don't have to be too imaginative. They might, as it says there, um, uh, that example about writing a letter, paying the son's facing. You've got to think of maybe two or three things that they're facing, but you don't have to be wild and imaginative. There's some some great examples there. Mm -hmm. um, so there isn't trick questions. The only the, the one thing I'd say, and it's repeating a bit what what Eamon said there, they will say the kind of things you need. So if they say write a letter to persuade somebody, you need to make sure the letter isn't just asking for something. It's actually actively persuading. Here it says telling them about the problem first of all it says telling so you need to be clear in the instruction and it says about the problems plural so you need to make sure there's more than one uh, and it says to the head teacher so as Eamon said there straight away it's head teachers it's probably going to be a bit more formal um so it, 
the information is all there. It might just take you. Actually, the reason planning is so good is it just means you send an extra minute or two just to really look at the question. So your planning's out and then look at the question. Go, mm. Have I actually told them and have I included more than one problem or have I included whatever it might be? So there aren't trick questions, but it is very important to look at the question, draft your answer, plan your answer as answer there, and then probably look at the question again and go, have I actually covered all the points that I need to there? Yeah, yeah, of course. And I'll always say in uh, your paragraphs, in your main body, so it'll be your introduction and then you go into your main body of the text, always refer back to the question if you can in a certain way. So the reader knows, actually, you might have just waffled on and you might have gone off, off the tangent a bit, but they might go back and say, you refer to the question and it'll bring the reader back to say, oh, actually, this is what they're saying. Um, so always try and refer back to the question where you can. So characteristics of writing a formal letter. That's a bog standard letter. There's not a lot of detail in there. <clears throat> However, if you have a look in, on the left hand side, the name and the address of the receiver, uh, the correct salutation, um, formal and professional. Name and signature at the bottom. Obviously, if you're using DA, it's yours sincerely. Um, in your exams with the new criteria what's gone uh what's passed i think it was in september um they are expecting if you're writing a letter or an email it says it on the actual exam um it's up to four to eight paragraphs with at least in each paragraph should be at least five sentences um and i normally the way i teach is if you have 10 words to a sentence you've got five sentences that's 50 words and um, the word count should be 250 to 300 words However, if you've hit them paragraphs, I won't worry about the word count because you've, you've, you've done what they've actually said. And then on the right hand side is the sender's address with the date underneath. I know one of the things I said previously and a couple of people sort of make mistakes is with the sender's address, your address. You don't need to put your name in with your address because you're going to sign the letter off from yourself anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's also good practice to write the the date in full as Eamon's done on there rather than writing four dash four dash whatever. Um, actually write it in full like that. It just makes it again because letters are a bit more formal. Um, it's worth doing. So they're a key. And the other thing, as Eamon said, is, is it is key to get sincerely or faithfully right. There's a number of ways you can remember it, but I don't like confusing people because if you've got a way, then I want it to work for you. Um, but as Eamon said, if you start with dear and their name, if you've included somebody's name, and put sincerely. One way to remember that is if you know someone's name, you might be more sincere. So that might be one way to remember it. The opposite, <laughs> if you don't know the name, so if you put dear manager or to whom it may concern, that's a bit more formal. So you think of F for formal, is F for faithfully. Uh, that's how it works for me. But if you've got a way to remember it, good. But uh, it's a very small thing, sincerely or faithfully. Um, but yeah. but it is quite important to get that right. Yeah, because I pick up on it in your in your marking. The characteristics of a formal email. So two is obviously who you're addressing your email to. Uh, your carbon copy, this is a copy of um, an individual. You, when you're copying an individual into an email who, needs, who also needs to see it. For example, you are emailing your work colleague about a task and you, you think your line manager needs to be involved in this too. So you can always use that. Um, subject is what is the email about? <clears throat> and obviously here in the, in the picture, you can just see the two CC and then the subject. Um, in, in the exam, it might even ask you to, if it's an email, to fill them details in on them bars. Um, so your paragraph one and two, introduction, including the purpose. For example, I'm contacting you because, um, introduce yourself in the first paragraph as well. So who are you and why are you writing to this person and what what's the purpose of the text? Um, your paragraph two will go, for, uh, go into more detail from paragraph one and then you hit the main body. So dear, obviously the name, always address the individual with a title. So good morning, good afternoon, and then miss, miss, whatever it is. <clears throat> Paragraph three, four, five, and six is your main body. Um, and I would normally suggest to have at least four points. So if you if you are covering eight paragraphs, yes, it sounds so it might sound, oh wow, how am I going to do it? But again, it's they suggest five to eight so it could be five intense paragraphs or it might even just be eight but you might not have that level of detail so you've spread it across it um if you have four points that's four paragraphs already so i wouldn't worry about the level uh, of paragraphs there is but again if you've got the points your detail will naturally fall in place uh your paragraph six and seven is when you're starting to close paragraphs 
again, if you've got the detail above, so if you say, for instance, you're hitting paragraph seven and eight, your the, the final paragraphs won't be that long. However, if you're on paragraph five and you think you've hit the word count and the level of information is quite detailed, you might just want to close it off and that's it, job done. Um, thank the individual for their time and their attention is always a good way to end it. Uh, and again, it's your sincerely best regards, best wishes with your name, uh, number and your title, if it is a formal email. <clears throat> uh, although it is a quick and instant form of communication, an email still needs to conform to standard English, paragraphing, grammar, spelling, punctuation. Please don't use no text talk. Um, even in your informal writing, which we'll talk about as well, try and keep away from the text talk what we do naturally in normal day life um, and keep it as formal as you can. I think that's one of the things because I'm sure you're all the same in your in your uh, everyday work we all tend to send so many emails nowadays that we are probably maybe more informal which is absolutely fine for somebody you know normally but you've got to remember this is a test so although yeah. you might be inclined to be more informal actually unless it specifically says email your friend in Australia if, it, if it's a more formal email you want to try and be careful of that language as well and, and say maybe just think whereas normally you'd write certain things but maybe I'll just expand on it a little bit for, for the test yeah. to remember. Um, yeah perfect I mean it's like yeah. the language technique we use the um, slang you can use anything in regards to that but it's just a bit different from your text talk so just as long as you know the variation between them that's perfectly fine. The other quick thing that I've known that I've raised before is they will give you the email address of who to send to and, and if they ask you to call, copy somebody in who it is, um, but you can't copy and paste, so make sure you type that in right. It seems like a really minor thing. I see it a lot of the times where some people put so-and-so email address at .co.uk, but actually in the tech, in the example it said .com, and that's only a really minor thing, and it, it, it's only one point. It's it's quite important, and I, to me, I always think if a, if a marker sees that you've got that wrong, they're going to be even more diligent about looking at your other spelling and punctuation, because... Yeah can't get the email address wrong when it's written out for you uh you you're more likely to make other mistakes as well so it's really little things like that just to be really careful of um yeah and again remembering it is a test so you want to show the best, yeah. best of your ability but even that one mark could be a difference between a pass and a fail yeah definitely, definitely. so like paul said i'd always go for make sure it's all correct and at the end of it make sure you proofread and everything so you you'll see your grammar yourself um when you proofread so informal wording these common phrases are used to greet an old friend or begin a conversation with a person you haven't seen for a very long time. These expressions are often followed by questions like how are you or what's new and it's a great way to start an informal piece of writing. You could even maybe include details of the last conversation. So again you might um, they might ask you to write an email or a letter to a friend asking them I don't know um, to help you raise money for charity but because you're writing it to a friend you could use these um, examples of informal wording. So we've got a few at the bottom. Um, hey John, long time no see, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, what's new? So just little things like that that you might use every day. But again, it's not complete text form, it's informal wording. <clears throat> so how to plan letters and emails, work out who the audience is um, from the writing and then you'll know whether it's formal or informal. It'll help you decide which greeting and ending to use. Um, and obviously that, from from my point of view, and I'm sure it's from Paul's as well, that's quite important. Um, your paragraph should tell you tell the reader why you're writing. The main body of the letter or email should develop your ideas and give you more detail. And the last paragraph should tell the reader what actions you want them to take. That first paragraph is, is you, you can structure in that way. Start with, I am writing you today to express my disgust. I am writing to you to complain about whatever. That's absolutely fine to, to make it clear. And, and as Eamon says, what you're doing then is you're also addressing the question, addressing the brief they've given you. I am writing today to tell you about an incident that happened in your restaurant, blah, blah, blah. And you've made it very clear as a, as a good introduction and then you can carry on to the rest of it. Yeah, and you can always use a real life situation because the examiner mm. isn't going to know you. They're not going to know who you are, where you're from, what you do. Um, they're just marking it. So even if it is a real life example, you'll probably, a lot of the questions I, I think you can relate to, um, and it gives you more to write about and you'll think, oh, I can add this point and add that point. The more you write and the intensive, I don't know, imagination you use, the more likely you, you'll hit that level to end work. <laughs> Louise is a good, good point there. No real names, though. Uh, and that's a, yeah, a little, you never know who's going to be marking it. The only thing I'd say, and, and I think I used this example once before, I have seen people before spend so long trying to come up with the address of their address in a letter. Um, yeah. They don't want to use the real address, which I understand, but just put one, two, three, 
road street it doesn't really matter what it is and i've seen people sitting their ages thinking what can i type and what can yeah. I do? what's the postcode just use your postcode and change a couple of numbers so yeah i'd, I'd avoid using some two real names and real people but uh, and things like if you put your phone number on you don't have to put your real one but don't yeah. spend ages doing it the market doesn't really care if it's a, if it's a, a well made up uh, address or, or phone number they just want to see something in there yeah yeah exactly yeah this one see the structure of it uh, so the structure, the documents um, should have a clear beginning, middle and end. The appropriate language should be used, so again, formal and informal. Um, if needed, you can use subheadings, um, bullet points and numbering to highlight any sections. Um, if it is necessary, I don't see why you can't use them, but if you don't need to, you don't have to. So in the beginning, obviously um, an appropriate title, if needs be. If it doesn't, it's just your subject in your email or highlighting it just under where, so say for instance, you don't know who you're writing to, underneath you can put letter of complaint um, and underline it. That's if you want to. I necessarily wouldn't, but there's no harm if you, if you wanted to do that. Um, it's your introductory paragraph, including who you are and why you're writing. Your middle section is your key issues or findings um, of what the, the topic is that you're relating to. <clears throat> options ideas and advantages and disadvantages um can go in in the main text of the writing key information could be written in bullet points again in different sections if you need to at the end you can state your conclusion recommendations and maybe demands if that's what the question's asking for um if you're provided options clearly detail which you think is best and why so is everyone okay up to that point Sorry, I'll unmute. Uh, another quick question um, from Louise is, um, will you be marked down if you don't use emotive language in a complaint? I don't necessarily think you'll be marked down. However, they do pick up on language techniques in your writing. Um, so I would suggest to use as much as techniques as you can. I'd recommend three to five. However, if you're using 10 techniques that we've already spoke about, by all means use them. The, the, the examiner will see the fact that you've, you've used these language techniques and it will make your writing a bit more detailed. And most of you probably know that, that functional skills went through a change um, a few months ago and some of you on this call are doing the old functional skills and some are doing the new. It's the same qualification, same level, just some slight differences between it. If you're not sure what you're doing and you want to know, we, we can let you know afterwards. Um, one yeah. of the things that the old marking used to have a specific number of marks for things like appropriate language. So actually in that one, I think I think it was usually at two marks. So you would get no marks if you hadn't used appropriate language. One if you'd use some, but to get that that full marks, you would maybe, as, you, as uh, Louisa said there, probably would need to use emotive language and a complaint to get full marks. The new marking for writing is a bit more um, general. So I think there's about 13, maybe 15 marks just for the content. And that includes the language and the, and the style of writing and formal or informal. So it's a bit harder to judge exactly whether you're gonna lose a mark or pick up a mark. But they are looking, as Amy said, for the general feeling of it. So um, you won't necessarily, if they look and say, well, there's no emotive language, you're going to mark it down. What's more like to happen is you're not going to get extra marks because if you don't use it. So it, it's more about getting extra rather than losing marks. Yeah. Uh, and Louise has put there, do you think it's a thinking outside your normal style? It goes back to that thing, to, to be blunt, it, it's a test. So something yeah. that you might not write normally, you think, well, it's a test. I want to prove, I, I, I think I've been emotive, but actually I'm going to use this word rather than that word just to really hammer home the point because it is a test. You know. Yeah, perfect. I'd agree. Super. Are there any more questions? No, all good. Perfect. So, your marking criteria, I've aimed for the level two and there may be level one learners on here. Um, the aim of it is by the end of your courses is if you're level one to hopefully hit sit your level two as well. Um, and if you're level two, this will work perfect. So they look for consistency throughout your writing um, the communication, uh, communication of information, ideas and opinions um, are communicated quite clearly, coherently and effectively. So you consistently write text of appropriate level of detail and length to suit purpose and audience and consistently organises writing for different purposes using appropriate format and structure and paragraphs if required. So it's come from the actual handbook, which again I will email out to all the learners and Paul will as well. Um, markers should read the candidate's response and make a holistic judgment about which band or uh, on balance best describes it. Within, e within each band, marks are rewarded for the candidate's overall level of performance. Once a band has been selected, markers should con consider the de uh, descriptors as a whole and award marks according to how well the candidate has met these overall. So it is down to the discretion of the marker. 
So it's not, you know, in maths, it's quite simple. It's pass or fail, um, right or wrong. In your English, is it's literally whoever, what I might pass, Paul might fail. Um, and again, it's that level of consistency. So if you are using information and ideas in your first two or three paragraphs and then you don't use any techniques in the last few, again, that's not consistent. So whatever you're doing at the top, make sure you're structuring that through all your paragraphs. A uh, quick question, Eamon, about titles. If you have titles in your emails or letters, should you capitalise the titles or not? No, I just underline them because you have the opportunity um, online to underline uh, bold if you want and italics. I just underline the title and maybe put it in bold if you want yeah. to. Again, you, you, if you use the practice test system, you'll see that it's it's a fairly straightforward system to do things like bold, under, underline, italic. It's not as fancy as word. You can't do different colours and put in images and things like that, but you can do <laughs> Bold, italic, underline, and bullet points. I think you can do as well. So there is some basic things there you can do. Yeah, perfect. So um, the next step is the exam style questions. The questions I'm not going to go through. Um, I'm just going to run quickly through them, but they're there for you to go through in your own time. So I know everyone's obviously working and you've got other responsibilities. So these are a few questions that I've put together um, where you think about the actual question and you can make a plan um, and then write the email or letter to what you want to do. So I know at the bottom it says write an email. You can write it into a letter if you want. But again, it's how you feel comfortable. So even if you did two bullet points as a letter to as an email, as long as you're comfortable in in writing in both them documents, that's completely fine. So a quick example, write an email to the council about young people throwing rubbish in your front garden. Straight away, I know from the top of my head, I can think about five to six points and that's just six paragraphs straight away with not including your introduction or your um, conclusion. So this is more your level one standard question, which is 13 marks. You want to go on a driving experience with Formula One, write an email to Formula One thinking about dates, times and prices. You might like to include where the test centre is based within the UK, if they offer a package for a certain amount of people, what you want to know about the test drive and the cost. If you're level two, I, I would suggest that you might even want to try this as a level one question, because then once you've tried your level one, you can step up to your level two and you'll see the difference in questions as well. And the, I'd say, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say actually that uh, that could easily be a level two question if they took yeah. out you might like to include. Yeah. So level one, they might have given you some bullet points there, things you might to include. But actually, if you took the first bit, that, that's a, uh, the same as a level two question. I would say just it probably yeah. wouldn't give you those things of what to include. That would be the key difference. So, yeah, definitely worth still trying. Yeah, the prompts. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, and this one is your level two type question. So you're in charge of organising your school's um, end of prom this year. It was held at the Nottingham race course. Students and staff had a great time. You booked this event after seeing um, an advert. So obviously they've given you a few bullet points of what the um, party consisted of. You're really pleased with the food, um, entertainment and service offered by Nottingham race course. Write a letter of thank you to Charlie Smith. The manager of the race course and they're giving you an address so you should include why you're writing the details of the event um what you liked about the party package so again them prompts might not be in a level two question um however if they are include them three bullet points and then add your own three bullet points you've got six paragraphs already it's told you you're writing a letter of thank you and it's told you who it's going to so you know already you don't even need to think about an address of where it's going you've got it um, and then just make up the top right address um, which will be from yourselves <clears throat> it also says there that you're really pleased with the food the entertainment and the service so again there's three bullet points you've got because you talk once about the food once about the entertainment and once about the service so again yeah. it's it sort of without saying it, it's giving you three bullet points to go through as well yeah perfect um, always remember to write ac accurately and in full sentences. You'll be marked on your spelling, punctuation and grammar. Make sure you plan your answer um, and set your letter out correctly. Um, in your paragraphs, make sure they are quite structured. So if you are talking about, I don't know, food in the second paragraph, end that point in that paragraph and then go on to entertainment and then go on to the third paragraph. Don't weave your food all the way through to paragraph eight. Try and finish that off in one paragraph. Um, and the final one, this is a mock exam from the new City and Girls um, reform. And again, Paul's mentioned that there might be people sitting it from the old um, City and Girls, Functional Girls, which we can find you one for that, but it's, they're pretty much similar. There's not, they're not much different at all. So 
you are fed up with all the litter you see in your area and you have an idea about organising a sponsor litter pick to solve the problem and raise money for charity. Your task is to write an email to your friend explaining your idea and asking for her help in organising the event. It's asking you to cover what the problem is, why it would be better if the problem was dealt with, what, it, what your idea is and how it would work on the day, the charity you would like to help um, and what you would like your friend to do to help organise the day. And then you've got a 250 to 300 words. So on this one, they've not actually told you how many paragraphs go in. They've given you the word count instead. You will find in the real test, there's, there's a box that tells you the number of words that you've typed. So, so you haven't got to worry about that. Uh, one thing just to, to warn people, uh, for some reason, that box isn't on the practice tests. So when you do the practice test, you won't know how many words you need to sort of have a quick count and see. But in the real tests, it will be there to tell you. Um, the other thing about this question, and, and, and Eamon's pointed about it a few times in terms of planning, there's five bullet points there. So for my planning, I'd probably want five bullet points. I thought yeah. problem equals uh, better because uh, idea equals. And, and straight away, you've got, a, a, by then adding an introduction and a conclusion, sort of summing up paragraph, you've, you've got your content and you'll reach the 250 words easy. Yeah, perfect. Um, what I might suggest is with Paul um, is, if you once you've attempted these and you've sent them out to who your tutors are, we'll send you a marked scheme out as well. So you can actually have a look at the work and see if you would mark it higher or lower to what we've marked it. So I'm not saying mark every single question, um, just mark one of your questions and then we can relate back to what you've actually done and say, actually, we might give you a mark where you didn't or we might not give you a mark where you have just to see that you might get an examiner that's quite strict or you might get someone that's quite lenient. You, you just don't know who's who's marking your work um, and it'll give you a bit more of a feel of how much information needs to go into your um, exams. Yeah, good point. So, so that's the end of the session. You should now know <laughs> the importance of planning your answer to a writing question, being able to identify characteristics of an email and a letter, structuring different documents, so obviously how, how it all falls into place, understanding the difference between formal and informal language. So please do not use your text talk. You can use slang for your informal, just not text talk. Do we have any more questions?